morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the CEO Story. We are really honored and blessed today. We have a super heavy hitter. We have Ryan in from uh, Hardcore Closers. This guy is a rock star. He's been through some amazing ups and downs, owns multiple seven and eight figure companies, and he started from nothing. So get your notepads ready. We want to shout out to Together CFO for sponsoring this podcast. We couldn't have brought it here without them. So Ryan, thank you so much for taking the time. Please, can you just kind of introduce yourself and then we can kick it off? Well, you know, first, I appreciate you uh, bringing me on your podcast and everything else. It's it's cool to be able to share a story with the audience, but I really enjoy getting to know the host as well, or at least sharing some kind of bond that we'll have forever. So I really appreciate that, Casey. Uh, I'm from Dallas. I've been here my whole life. I guess I could live anywhere in the world, but I really like it here. And I've got three sons and a wife and, you know, my businesses, uh, they're all around the world. We have businesses in multiple states and we have clients in pretty much every continent on the planet. Uh, but man, I just really like Dallas because it's in the middle of the country and it's easy to get in and out of an airplane to get to the vents and stuff like that. So I'm a, I'm a, a true thoroughbred Texan, I guess. Uh, all right. Anything else. Well, cowboys then, right? Man, you know what, dude? It's I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so focused on winning all the time. It's hard for me to, to you know, what I'm saying, like, I'm just gonna say, like, I belong to Jerry Jones's private club. Like, it's, it's maybe two miles from my house. I hang out there on a regular basis, man. But lately, I've been hanging out so much, right? Because I don't want to get caught. <laughs> like, it's embarrassing, man. But, but yeah, go Cowboys. You know, all maybe right. next year, go Cowboys in 2021. <laughs> You'll get back to that great success that you had back in the days, I'm sure. So let's yeah. jump into it. We want to be respectful of your time as well. So when you initially started out, you were kind of in real estate and loan officer type roles. And you went from that. And now you've built this whole global empire, which is phenomenal. Multiple different businesses, different verticals. And there's a lot to consume there, even if someone just looks at the, the amount of accolades that you have. So congratulations, firstly. But if someone's listening in and they're kind of at the start of their journey or they're stuck along that journey, uh, can we kind of dig into how you went from where, when you were just a regular loan officer to now being a multimillionaire working and impacting tens of thousands of people on a daily basis and chunk that down into smaller actionable steps? Well, I think first with, with my particular situation, I got I to gotta take it back because this is what most people's like, where did you get your first break? We'll call that loan officer. And then what happened from there? But, but really, I want to talk to you because if there were some things that I didn't do before that. They would have, they would have never, I wouldn't be where I am today. Yeah, and so, foundation setting, right? Well, so, uh, you know, at a young age, I, I was adopted and uh, I was like five or six years old and, and moved around a little bit. It's kind of like the, our family got in some trouble with the bankers in town. And so we were kind of like a, a stigma family, you know what I mean? In the small town. And we moved back to the big city and we moved to the big city. Couldn't make it anyway, dropped out of high school. Wasn't my thing. End up, you know, dealing a little bit of drugs, end up using a little bit of drugs, end up doing a little bit of time in prison. And when I got out of prison, I was probably 21 or 22 years old. And I had been in some hardcore prisons. And uh, when I got out, I just told myself, you know what? The thing that's going to separate me from everybody in there is my work ethic. I'm going to outwork. I'm going to do so. I'm going to make something in my life. I went to work at a car wash, started off vacuuming cars. I worked, man, I, I went to work for my stepdad at his car wash. And he was so pissed at me that I'd been to prison and everything else that long story short, he made me start from the bottom at minimum wage. So all these people talking about hiking minimum wage and shit. When I got out of prison, I worked for minimum fucking wage, which wasn't even seven bucks. It was like $5 and 50 cents an hour back then but I worked 70 hours a week so I could get overtime and make ends meet. Now, how did I get 70 hours a week? I outworked everybody else. So they wanted me to fucking work because they knew the job would be done right. Okay. So after a couple of years of doing that, one of the customers comes into the car wash. that was a regular customer and offers me a job in the banking business. And I'm on a mission to own this car wash one day. I'm like, if I just work and save my money uh, at this point, I'm making about 10 50 an hour. Right. And then a little commission cause I'm selling car washes too. And so, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay. I make about 50 grand a year. And it's for a dude that just got out of prison a couple of years previously. I was high yeah, on the right. hog, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so this, this lady's regular customer, she comes in, she says, every time I come in here, you sell me a car wash that I really don't want to pay for in the first place. And then you vacuum my car. Half the time you're up front wiping the damn thing off. She's like, does anybody else work here? 
And I was like, well, you know, my strategy is to outwork everybody else because then they won't put other people on the clock so I can get more hours. I can do three people's work. She's like, I tell you what, I'll give you a job. And I was like, I got a job. This place is awesome. I love washing cars, you know? And she said, no, I'll give you a real job where you can become rich. And I was like, well, what do you do? And she said, I do mortgages. I said, well, what, what is a mortgage? And she said, you know, like a, a bank loan against your house. And I was like, oh man, I don't even have a credit card. I paid for my truck cash. You know, I, I like got a bank account, but I don't ever keep any money. In it. Different world to where you were at at that point, right? Yeah. I'm like, man, I don't know that I'd be qualified to even work in a bank. And I told you my family got in trouble with the banks when I was young. And I don't still know the whole story of that, but it was big enough to stick in me as a kid. You know what I'm saying? And so you had, right? She go, and she goes, I'll teach you all of that. And I said, well, that's cool, but I'm also a convicted felon. And she goes, for what? And I said, for drugs. And she goes, eh, you'll fit in just fine in my office. And so I quit the car wash. This is what she said to fin finalize the conversation. She said, tell you what, come work for me. And if it don't work out, I'll get your job back here at the car wash. And I was like, okay, I got nothing to fucking lose, right? So yes. I go turn in my keys, put in my notice. I left the car wash. Monday, I show up at the work. Now, I noticed I got this trend, right? If I just outwork these people in the office, but man, it wasn't shit to outwork the bankers because these dudes show up at like 10 a.m., go to lunch and drink margaritas, work, come back at two, work till four, and then go spend the rest of the day drinking and networking with realtors. I went in there, started, I didn't know shit. So I started, they didn't have YouTube back then either, right? So I'm like, that's how old I am. I'm like reading manuals and stuff with words and I'm having to look up in dictionaries and all, dude, it was, it was wild. But after uh, about a week in there and listening to people and all this stuff, I got my first deal. Two weeks after that, it paid me. I made it like 8,600 bucks. Um, the week after that, I got another deal and it paid me like $14,000. So here I am made in a month, 45 days, what used to take me half a year to make, dude. And I was like going all in. But the problem was I ran out of people to sell houses to, right? I knew two people that could maybe buy a house and I fucking sold them both the house. So now what? And that was when I was like, it was a Saturday afternoon and I'm frustrated how I'm going to pay my bills next month and blah, blah, blah. Cause dude, I took that money and went and bought it's long story, right? Like shit you do when you first get money, you do dumb stuff with it and went paid off furniture and finally furnished my house and all this stuff. Right. And so anyway, then I'm like, shit, how am I going to take care of all this? And this commercial comes on TV. It's like this Saturday, rich dad, poor dad seminar. I'm like, rich dad, poor dad. It's like, huh. All right. I don't know. Kiyosaki. Yeah. I'm like, I don't even know what that means, but you know what? It's a real estate thing. And there's going to be people that want bank money there. And so I'm going to go to that seminar. And so I went to the seminar and networked with people and shook hands and, you know, and like I watched the people buy the product and I didn't have enough money to buy the, the like $5,000 deal they were selling, but I watched people that bought it. And then I hit those people up because those are voted most likely to get some shit done. Right. Well, one dude from the very first event that I went to, uh, and this was a free event. One dude gave me 51 transactions within like a fucking six month period of time. I did 51 wow. transactions for this one dude, which put about $200,000 in my pocket. Right. Then that dude taught me how to invest in real estate. Cause that's what we were doing, you know, and he would break it down and was mentoring me as his banker and shit like that. I started investing in real estate. And by the time I was 26 years old, I was making $700,000 a year. And like, by the time I was 22, so this is a short period of time, four years. By the time I was 22, I was coming out of a, a hardened prison system, working at a car wash. But the, the common factor that got me that big break, because that wasn't, I mean, life's full of ups and downs. It hadn't been all, you know, rainbows and sunshine since then. But that big break, it was hard work. And that's where so many people are like, what's the secret to success? Outwork every other motherfucker around you. That's it. That's all. Let's break that down, right? Because... That's easy to say, and people, a lot of people just don't have that commitment to doing it every single day. What was that fire inside you that made you want to keep doing that day after day, 12, 15 hour days, just constantly working and grinding? Because I think most people can do that one, maybe two days, but then by week three or month four, they've fallen off. So what was the thing that kind of kept you going for all those years? Well, I'm still going now, man. And, and, and I'm going to tell you there's, and this isn't this way for everybody, but me coming from the hardened past that I had, my first mission when I got a taste of success, right? In 2005, 2004, because I started the mortgage job at like the end of 2004, like October, right? So 2005 was my breakthrough year uh, where I got those 51 deals plus the other stuff I had going. Now, reason why I say that is that 
what happened to me was the cops raided my house. They thought I was selling drugs. I bought this nice fucking house after 2005. I'm like, I went and bought a big ass fucking, you know, house and bought all these nice cars and was entertaining people at the house. But I have nothing to do with drugs anymore. It was all legal money. Well, the cops ran my record. They saw that people were coming and paying rent to me. They think people are picking up drugs, right? But it's really realtors dropping off checks, people paying rent, loan officers stopping by, borrowers stopping by. I was working out of my house. Uh, we had an office, but I just worked from home. They thought I was selling drugs. They raided my house. They didn't find any drugs, but they found a gun. Somehow they tied the gun to me, even though it wasn't mine. And uh, cause I had a roommate there with me, but it, it wasn't mine. I ended up going to federal prison and all my friends went, I knew he was up to no good. They all didn't believe that I went to prison for a gun. They thought I committed financial crime. So I get out, I go 2008 and get out of federal prison. I go back to the mortgage world. Right. But this time my mission was this, I'm going to prove all these people who thought I was a crook wrong. And then when I do it again, after going to prison twice, what's that going to say about their life? Okay, but then I've got out and obviously the economy collapsed in 2009, but I was pushing forward strong, dude. I made $300,000 in 2009. Obama signed something called the Dodd-Frank Act in 2010 and it wouldn't allow me to have a license anymore because I was a felon. Went away, so son of a bitch, you know what I mean? Like every time I turn around. So then I, I had a realtor friend of mine that turned me on to this internet marketing stuff and I'm like, dude, most of these people are talking about get money the lazy way. If I write 10 blog posts every day, make two videos every day, if I just outwork all of them in a couple of years, I'll have more than all of them, which is at the point we're at right now. And it's just, it'll be, it'll be a big deal for me. So I just, I just hammered in. And my first mission was to prove everybody who thought, who laughed at me, who said, oh, look, he lost his license. Yeah. Oh, look, you went back to prison. I wanted to, and it wasn't about like proving them wrong as much as it was like, now what, motherfucker? You're still in that same situation. I done been through this fire three fucking times and, and bounced back and you're over there still with a flat tire, right? But then what happens is you, you get that out of your system and you kind of look down on those people because you've made it further up the hill and you kind of feel bad for them. You know what I'm saying? And that, that first fiery mission to prove them wrong was cool. It made me a millionaire. But that shit ain't going to take me to 100 million plus. That's not what's going to get me there. So I had to, that was good fuel, but I had to refuel, right? That, that, that tank of gas had run out. So I had to really write a mission for my life. And my mission isn't to be a sales trainer or to make a bunch of money. I believe God gave me the assignment on this planet to help people be the greatest version of themselves. I used to sell dope, now I sell hope, you know what I mean? And- I love and, that phrase, I used to sell dope, but now I sell hope. That's me, baby, you know? And and that's what I'm doing, I, like this story, right? I'm not telling you the one, two steps in business or how to do real estate or mortgages, but what I'm showing you is that it would have been easy for me to say, hey, they were right, this shit ain't for me. Hey, they were right, you know, I am a loser. Oh shit, the cops got me again, this must not be for me. But no, I just figured those are stepping stones on the way to success and never stopped until I got there. But here's the cool thing now, ladies and gentlemen, I got a garage full of exotic cars, I live in fucking a huge house, I have kids in private school, I don't have debt, I'm debt free other than a mortgage and a couple car payments. Right, like, cause why would you pay cash money for cars or houses? But I don't have any business debt. I don't have any credit card debt. I ain't got no student loans. I don't have any debt on the businesses or the assets that I own. It's all fucking free and clear, bootstrap from the bottom. So, and, and you just heard that I came, when someone says they come from the mud, I'm telling you that's where I came from. And if I could do this shit, my whole hope for you is that you'll go, man, this guy, he don't even seem that smart, man. If he can pull this shit off, surely I can outwork enough people to make it in my own way too. Absolutely, I think, and I think that's the key, right? Is having that internal fire and realizing, hey, that fuel that was there because I wanted to prove everyone wrong is now run out. What's my next, where do I get the top of the fuel? And kind of knowing yourself well enough to, to re-engage yourself to move to that next new higher level, right? Well, I mean, you know, when you prove them wrong, you prove them wrong. What are you going to do? Prove them double wrong? You know what I mean? Like I already proved them wrong. So that wasn't going to work for me anymore. You know, and, and what happens though, is if you don't find my first mission, prove them wrong. Second mission, help people be the greatest version of themselves. Right. And so in the second mi mission is a lot bigger because there's a lot less people I had to prove wrong than what I, I didn't have to prove 20,000 people wrong, but I've changed 20,000 paying customers lives. You know what I mean? And so for, for me, I had to get new fuel because 
if you don't get new fuel, you'll get lazy. You'll be like, I proved them wrong. Now I can rest. No, no, no. You got to get another mission so you can keep going. The force of average wants you to be average. It wants you to rest. It wants you to take your foot off the gas. That's the algorithm on this planet and how it works. If you're going to beat that shit, you got to keep going. And the only way to keep going is not craving more money. It's not craving more attention. It's coming up with a mission that's so big, you'll never complete it till the day that you die. And I think that's a really good point. When you look at most successful people, they never really stop. They're always going regardless of how old they are, they keep going because they've just got that nature and it's just so wired into them that at that point that they can't just stop and play golf and see out the rest of their life like that. It's, uh, you have to but have- We know what happens when they do, right? People retire, they stay at home, they're fucking dead a month yeah. later, you know? Exactly. And, and I don't think that we should ever retire. I think that was, that, that's an idea that comes from factory workers and indentured servants, basically slaves, right? To where you've worked long enough that you don't have to work anymore we're not in that age anymore we're not banging sledgehammers and building railroads and picking cotton and all that shit, right we're on zoom meetings doing podcasts we're we're in executive meetings we're we're, we're doing stuff on the internet coding doing social media these things it's like a totally different world so we don't need to be thinking about retirement we need to think about the evolution of a business person going from an employee to self-employed to being the CEO of an actual company that you own, to replacing yourself as CEO and being the owner slash investor of companies that you own that do not require you to work in them, but pay you. And that's the point that so many people miss. They're relying on that 401k to pay them or that pension that doesn't exist anymore to pay them. And they're so focused on that, that they didn't even think that, hey man, I never really got to retire. I just got to build something that I can own that will generate enough cash for me to live on. And look, if I was if I was a person that was 65 and hadn't built something like that, man, I would take my social security checks in a direct deposit account in America and I would go live my ass in Thailand or Costa Rica or something like that where it don't cost much to live. But so many people don't think that way, you know? But let's say you build a business or you, got a, you bought a couple of rent houses throughout your life and those rent houses are paying you $500, $1,000 a month. Maybe you got a business paying you two or $3,000 a month that you invested in at some point. It's like five grand a month. You live high on the hog in Mexico or Costa Rica or something like that. Hell, a lot better than you could uh, here in America. And, and you never really have to retire. You're just letting your assets pay you. So, so many people miss that point. It's, it's a really good point. It's passive cash flow. And uh, what you touched on earlier was a piece of advice that I had when I was younger from one of my friends. It was, I'm not the CEO. I hire CEOs. And I never really got that when he told me it. But as I reflect back on that, it's more along the lines of most people aspire to be the CEO, but you can only manage so many businesses at any one time. If you're the, the chairman of the board or if you're just a silent partner, you're having that money work for you at multiple different levels and stages and like yourself globally at this point where you're just picking up a passive check and you're just checking to make sure that everything's ticking over nicely. And it's taken maybe an hour or two of your, of your week or of your month rather than tens of hundreds of hours a month. Right. Yeah. And really, in my opinion, the COO is more important than the CEO anyway, you know, cause like the CEO is the big picture guy and everything else, but the CEO is the person that puts the shit in play. And uh, so many people, you know, like your friend, they're hiring CEOs. When I look at stuff, I'm like, okay, who's running this shit? Because the CEO is not usually the dude that does the least amount of work. Let's just be real, right? Mm -hmm. That title is the I made it to the top title. Everybody else got to do the work. So I'm looking for the person that's still putting the operations in because that's where the money's made in business anyway, right? On how smooth the operations are. Yeah, absolutely. So when, when, let's just talk about your current businesses that you're involved in and break down how you kind of pivoted and succeeded in those. Um, let's pick one. Should we pick, let's start with the hardcore closer. This is where you help. Well, you can, you can explain it better than me. Yeah. So my, my, uh, my company's called hardcore closers. Like that's what we started as. And uh, that we realized in 2014, I started that company in 2010, I think. And in 2014, we realized that that's a cool name, but it's not a, uh, it's not a global brand, right? Like people, like some people, hey, I'm a hardcore closer, but a lot of people like, man, this is cool shit, but I can't really wear that brand on my job. So we opened a company called Break Free Academy, right? It's more my style anyway. And um, in Break Free Academy, you know, I've got roughly 23, 25 employees and uh, we run it out of an office in, in a high rise in Dallas and got 23, 25 employees. 
And we built 90% of our business on referrals. Like, so a lot of it comes from organic social media, but you know, my friend was just asking me the other day how much money we spent in ads last year. We literally spent zero in 2019 or 2020 and still grew and have blown up uh, exponentially. I mean, we've got, you know, 20, between pr probably at this point around 22,000. I know it's over 20 last time I checked. So we're probably at this point, 21, 22,000 people have bought our products, you know, and I mean, it's just been a, a big game changer for us. We do live events and the big pivot for us is we do a thousand person live event every year and we do it in April. Well, this year in April, everybody was locked down. So we were literally the first people to come out with the big names and big everything virtual event. We had 30,000 people attend online. Again, we ran no ads. We gave the whole thing away for free, refunded everybody's ticket that had already paid. So I refunded a thousand fucking tickets just because I'm a good dude and don't blow people's money. Hotel gave me my money back. I gave everybody their money back. Then we gave it away for free. We're like, fuck it. If we don't have to fly people in or rent hotels, we're not going to charge for it. And that really put us at the forefront like, oh shit, Stuman cares. He's not saying, oh, you're stuck at home anyway. Give us 99 bucks to be on this shit. They're like, dude, he's trying to help us through the middle of this fucking pandemic when we all thought it was a real thing. Now it's kind of like, yeah, it could be bullshit. But back then everybody thought it was real. You know, everybody's like, oh, dude, there's bodies in China. We're going to die, right? We were all freaked out. So people looked at me and I did a series of different things on um shit that, that I don't even make money from. I did a webinar this year, last year, that we had 4,000 people live on, on a registered webinar. For, I did it one time and one time only, teaching people how to get money out of their 401k without penalties because of the new laws that were passed, right? And just like shit that I know to do, that I teach the guys that work with me and my clients with how to do. And so, man, we just helped a ton of people. And so this year that built so, or last year that built so much goodwill that dude, by the time... October, November, December came around. We were doing four times what we were doing in January. Wow. Like monthly revenue. And we're, we're you know, it's only January now. We're still killing it. January is typically the slowest uh, month of the year for me because most people, they like make their resolutions, figure out they can't do it on their own by February or March. They need me, right? And so January is typically slow. Dude, we've had the, the biggest January right now. It's five days into January and we've made more money this January than we've made in any January in the past. And again, we still got 26 days to go. So I love, firstly, how much you're on top of your numbers. I think for any successful entrepreneur really needs to understand the numbers and how they're trending and be able to, to make decisions based on those trends. Secondly, Dude, if, we, if I didn't know that, but just to interrupt you, sorry, but that's so important because for five years, I spent like 50 to 100 grand a month on ads on Facebook, right? And in one day, Facebook just canceled my account. I didn't track my numbers. I just figure ads, blah, 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 it's working. You know what I mean? Whatever, right? We just, we're sales guys. We just needed leads. Then one day, Facebook banned my account. I don't know why. Maybe, maybe hardcore or something like that. Finally, it caught up with their AI or whatever, right? I couldn't get anybody to get my account back on despite spending all that money, but I never had a rep. I just knew what to do. And I thought, you know what? Fuck it. We'll see. You know, we'll see if we got to run ads. The next month, we made more money. The next month after that, we made more money for two years now. I didn't run ads. So there's no telling. Now, I'm sure those ads helped me out to one degree or another. But there's had I been tracking the profitability of that shit and realized that most of our stuff came from referral and organic anyway, there's no telling how many millions of dollars I could have saved over those years to put into infrastructure and other stuff. But lesson learned, you know, better late than never. And that's the key thing, you did learn the lesson and now you're on top of your numbers and you can tell just by that comment on the January versus previous Januaries and knowing how far along you are in your month, I think any successful business owner that needs to be on top of their shit needs to know the numbers intimately well. So that, that's a really, really good point. And then the second part that I really liked was uh, the value add. It's really is about you caring and providing value and not trying to just make a quick 97 bucks, which makes no difference to your lifestyle at all. But to someone else who's struggling to pay that $97 and travel to Dallas or wherever the event is, it's the, it could be a life changing difference for them. So I really like that in terms of the people listening is how can you add value to others? It doesn't have to cost you anything, but if you've got some knowledge that you can share that can help someone else that's in a darker place or just needs a little bit of a push, then the right thing to do is just help them however you can, right? Yeah, you know, that's one thing that's been really cool about 
the way that we've been doing events since 2013 or 2014, 2013. And we've done them with some people that are on TV and then eventually did them myself. And, you know, I have a lot of friends that are big names that get paid big amounts of money to speak on stage that, you know, don't charge me. And I don't charge them when I go out there either. I get paid, you know, 25 grand to speak on stage, but I have relationship with these core 20 people, we'll just call them, that are big names that everybody follows that, that normally would be 50 or hundred grand to speak. And I can call them up and say, Hey, you want to do million dollar mastermind this year? And I do them probably every other year. So I'm not burning the, the relationship unless they ask, you know what I mean? And dude, every year we have celebrities, professional athletes, Super Bowl winners, influencers that come and speak because they love my crowd so much, man. We, we attract such good people. And, you know, that was a big deal. There's some people that threw this last crowd, year. Ryan. It's that they love you as well, is that they see the value that you're bringing to the world. And so, yes, the crowd is good and receptive. But it's the, the fact that you're a real good dude, because if you weren't a good dude, they wouldn't be taking those calls. They wouldn't be doing that for free. So there's a whole That's element true. of you really giving back from your heart and trying to better other people through the ups and downs of life. Well, yeah. And that's, that's what I'm saying is like some people, let's say that you want to get Eric Thomas to come out for 50 grand, right? Like you got to pay him up front. So some people planned events in July, they paid Eric in January to reserve him because he's booked months out. Right. And, and, you know, maybe he, I'm sure he gave the money back. He's a great dude, but there's a lot of speakers that were like, you know, shit, it is what it is or whatever, you know, and, and that's in the contract. If you cancel, I keep it. And so not everybody could refund stuff. And so, man, I'm fortunate that I got such good friends that, you know, that, that don't even ask me to pay for their airline fare and shit like that, that'll speak at these. So I was able to give everybody their money back without a hassle. And so in a year where a lot of people that do live events burn bridges and cross people, I was able to, I, I not only gave people their money back, Casey, I gave them their money back plus 10 times their money back credit in our store, digital products and swag. So people started using that money to buy t-shirts. Guess what's all over social media all of a sudden? My t-shirts and hats. Right. So we not only refunded it, we gave them extra stuff that helped our brand for the inconvenience. And they love us so much. They're willing, you know, to support it in their stories and stuff like that. So, you know, it was it was a, a big power move for us that kind of just put us a little bit level up above a lot of people last year. Yeah. And it shows it, sh it really shows the true colors. Right. When the shit hits the fan, how people react, it shows who the real person is and what your real intentions are. And, and I think that's a great reflection on you and your business. and and your network. One other thing that I wanted to touch on, which I thought was a really good point, is that you've succeeded really well without any ad spend. So a lot of people listening may just be starting a business, may not have that additional five, 10 grand a month to test and kind of really refine ads and get it down. And you, you're a prime example of saying that you don't necessarily need to spend all that money on ads. You can figure it out another way, an organic way, a natural way. Can you just speak to that a little bit more? Yeah. So let me first give you my definition of the difference between marketing and, and advertising. Okay. So marketing is the content, the piece of content, whether it's a, a flyer for an advertisement or whether it's a video for an advertisement or whether it's just a video on YouTube, right? That's, that's marketing, right? Advertising, just so we're clear is the exchange of dollars for exposure, okay? So that's all, an, a lot of people think an ad is like written and no, that's marketing piece. That's the content piece of the marketing side. An ad, the, the advertising is simply exchanging money for exposure. So it, when I break it down to its most simplistic form in that way, it allows people to think, okay, so, cause you can run ads for $5 a day if you want, right? I mean, you're not gonna, eventually you'll compound if you're doing it right, but you can start out for five or $25 a day. So you don't have to be rich to run ads, but what you do gotta be good at is creating the marketing piece and then deciding, making the correct decision of whose attention you're gonna pay to get in exchange for that advertising, right? And this is where so many people mess up. They might. They might say, hey, I'm going to spend $100 on an ad. And they're just kind of throwing it out there to, oh, you know, I sell insurance. Anybody can buy my stuff. No, 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 no. You need to create a marketing piece around loan officers and run an advertisement exchange for attention to a, a loan officer audience talking about how you can handle their insurance needs for their clients and save them money on their refinances, right? You need to dig into whose attention you're going to pay for. If you haven't gotten that figured out yet, then you need to just stick to organic marketing. Now, here's the other thing. 
for me, I like the organic marketing because like with an advertisement, I can pay money and maybe it'll get me in front of strangers or scale me. But if I'm really good at the organic stuff, if I'm a good writer, if I'm good on video, if I can create a good podcast like we're doing here, then guess what? I'll get in front of strangers anyway, because people that know me will share it. And they're connected to people that I don't know that may even share it's connected to somebody else. I had a video last year that was shared 17,000 times on Facebook that I didn't pay a dime for, right? I didn't run an ad to it. It was on my personal page. And guess what? There's probably 50 or 100,000 people that, that got to watch my story and thought it was really awesome for a couple of days during the quarantine. And that probably have followed me and bought some of my stuff by now you know, which is a really cool thing, but I didn't have to pay for that. So my focus isn't so much on the advertising anymore. It's on making the correct, because here's the thing, Facebook will advertise for you for free. If you create good content, it'll put it in front of more people. It'll show, you know what I'm saying? It'll put it on the different distribution channels, all that stuff. And same with YouTube or Instagram or anything else. So, you know, first you got to dial in with that marketing piece. And then oftentimes if you get good with that marketing piece, you don't even have to run ads because it'll take off on its own. And I think a really good point is niching down. If everyone is your customer, then no one's your customer because you're spreading yourself too thin. It's really understanding that avatar. What are their specific pain points in their industry? And does your solution really solve that? And if it does, the messaging should naturally resonate with that person. Got it. Okay, so Ryan, to be respectful of your time, we like to normally end with one question. And that is, and I think I already know the answer, but I, I want to hear it from you. If you had to split your success over three factors, uh, and those three factors being drive, skill, and how lucky you were, how would you apportion that? I would say 90% drive, 10% skill, and 0% luck, man. Yeah, I thought you know, in the beginning, like now that. I would say that it's probably 50 drive and 50 skill because I've worked on my skills for the last 12 years. But in the beginning... It was definitely 90% drive, 10% skill, and, and those were limited skills, but I don't ever think I've considered myself lucky. Uh, the harder you work, the luckier you get, right? It's a saying that I hear a lot. That's not always true either in my case, but you know what? I, uh, I, I don't want to be lucky. I, like, I feel like it, when you're, you're up in heaven before you're born, and this is all metaphorical, but you know, and, and, and God's like, so what, what, what level you want to play this game down on this planet on, right? And, and I'm like, man, I must have said super extremely hard. Let me get, let put me in. I'm going to beat it anyway. You know? yeah. <laughs> Great, fantastic. So if every, anyone wanted to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to be able to contact you? Yeah, just go to hardcorecloser.com. Everything's there. There's, you know, 2,000 plus articles, 1,000 videos, all my podcasts, which we got 2 million monthly listeners on my podcast on Rewire all the information about everything I do, connect with me on social media. It's all at hardcorecloser.com. And we'll put the links down there and 5 million plus views on YouTube as well and many other millions of accolades that uh, we don't have time to list them all. But Ryan, thank you so much for sharing with us. It's been an amazing experience and I'm sure you've offered lots of value to the listeners. So thank you so much. Yeah, hey, you know what, folks? Ain't nothing to it but to do it now. So get after it. <laughs>